Because pride blinds a person to the reality of God and the reality of life. Psalm 10 4. It says there, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Does that make sense? So when someone is so full of themselves in their own head, when so consumed with themselves, they don't leave any room for God. And so the thoughts of God are not there. And they don't go seeking after God. And that's why the, the Bible actually tells us that no man seeketh after God. You see, that tells us that pride is a problem for every person. They become the most important thing in the world. And God is not one who they seek after because ultimately people don't want to bow the knee to someone else. They want to be their own gods. And then they want to fashion a God after themselves. That is probably more relevant and open today than any other time in history. And unfortunately, people's egos become more important to them than their eternal souls. As long as I keep my ego in a, in a nice place, keep it enthroned, make it feel good, that's more important than reality, the reality of an eternal existence. And so pride, it says here, blinds the sinner. It blinds them. It blinds them to the existence of God and the need for God. And it even clouds the vision of a believer. Even believers can get infected with pride. It's insidious. It blinds the sinner to the existence of the only one who really can honestly glorify himself and be gloried in himself. And that's God. Because he's the only one who's perfect, who's, who has all the attributes to glory. We have no reason to glory. Our knowledge is limited. Our power is infinitesimally small. We do not last forever. We fall apart. We, we rely on so many things just to take our next breath. It's ridiculous. God is the only one who doesn't need anyone else to survive. He doesn't need anything else to live. He is the source of all life. He is the source of knowledge. He's the creator of all things. He is ultimately powerful and knowledgeable. And we, compared to him, if any person boasts, is a foolish, foolish thing when you think about it. It's like an ant boasting against a person. How great they are. Well, that's, that's even a weak example. Because an ant compared to a person is much bigger, much greater than a person compared to God. Sometimes God... When someone gets too inflated in their own ego, mercifully gets their attention away from themselves and snaps them out of their foolishness and gives them a bit of a reality check. And this is what happened, this happens in this particular story here. Um, Nebuchadnezzar had become a bit too big, a bit too inflated in his, own, in his own mind. And God said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, time for a reality check for you. And what you'll notice, which is interesting about this particular chapter, is the way it begins. It's unusual compared to the rest of the Bible because it's an official Babylonian state proclamation. Okay? It's a proclamation that he made to his entire realm, to his kingdom. And it was authorized by himself to his subjects. And we believe it was, it was made in the year 562 BC. So it's, it was intended as a public confession of his sin and the lesson that he'd been taught by God. How he confessed his pride and it, it explained the reason that he'd been missing for seven years. You see, he'd been out of the picture for seven years and he had to get someone else to rule in his place. So people didn't see him anymore. They saw uh, his son. And so this was an explanation of where he'd been for seven years. But if you think about it, this public confession, 
put his pen to quite a fair bit of humility. So it achieved its purpose. For him to publicly confess his sin and admit his mistake and confess that God is the one who was right and he was wrong um, would have taken a fair bit of humility. When was the last time you publicly confessed your sins? You might like to come up to the front here. Don't take us. <laughs> one thing that we one thing that we learn one thing that we learn from this from this particular chapter is the dramatic turnaround in this fellow called Nebuchadnezzar. To publicly give a testimony about where you messed up uh, would have taken a fair bit of um, fair bit of humility. So it begins with this rather Christian sounding words, peace be multiplied unto you. And you've you've read those in the in the New Testament letters, but to hear it from a king who increased his kingdom through war and bloodshed is a bit of a strange one. But the words are a strong, a stark contrast from his previous uh, arrogant pronouncements. If you remember, he used to make he used to love making decrees in Nebuchadnezzar. If anyone does this, they're going to be burnt, you know, alive. If anyone says this, they're going to be you know, turned into a dunghill and their whole houses are going to be destroyed and families are going to be washed off the face of the planet. He used to love making pronouncements because he had ultimate power. He could be. There was no one on an earthly scale who was actually more powerful than him. But what we see over the course of four chapters is the change in his mentality toward God and the change in his perspective with his own, with himself compared to God. If you notice the first, the first four chapters, you'll notice that when it came to uh, the calling his astrologers for the first dream that he had, and he realized they couldn't do anything about it. And finally he, he, he called Daniel and Daniel interpreted the dream and, and he, he had to admit, he had to make a public uh, profession that the God of Daniel was the God of gods. He was the one who could let people know this is truth. No other God could do that. And then when it came time to creating a golden statue of himself and demanding people, you know, fall down and worship that idol, and then you have these three who actually refused to do that, at the end of that, he called them out of that fiery furnace and he had to admit that, yes, their God was greater than him. Because remember, his, his pronouncement was, who can save you out of my hand? So he had to admit that God was greater than him. But now he's got to the back of the same place where he's actually arrogant and proud and boastful. And he looks on his kingdom and he says, look at this. This is all mine. I've done, I've, I've done all this. And God is about to teach him a very valuable lesson. But at the end of this, we see the result of what God was teaching him. Look at verse, uh, verse 1 again, Daniel chapter 4. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. That's the pronouncement of God of someone who understands, who's beginning to understand who God is. So at the beginning of this, and before the time of his, his seven years of you might call madness, the king was living in relative ease, in comfort and in in uh, in, in power and, uh, and 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 riches. He was living rich, he was living sumptuously, while many people in his kingdom were living very poorly. A bit like the rich man in Lazarus, the story that Jesus gave. And he says in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was arrested in my house and flourishing in my palace. Yeah, he was living it up. He was having a good time. It's good to be the king. Huh? When you've got everything that you ever wanted. But also, this would explain, if you get into verse 27, what Daniel's call to him was. When Daniel came and interpreted that dream, 
He says in verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you. Please listen to what I've got to tell you, king. This is my counsel. This is my advice for you. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening, lengthening of thy tranquility. In other words, your peace. Looked as if Nebuchadnezzar had was in a position of such power and authority and riches, and maybe the people around him were living very richly, but he'd forgotten about everyone else in his kingdom, and, there, and by the looks of it, there was a great deal of suffering going on, and he'd become too inflated in his own ego. And so, as before, Nebuchadnezzar calls in his astrologers, magicians, Chaldeans, and sorcerers. And as before, they couldn't interpret the dream. You know, maybe he was, you often wonder, why did he just call Daniel in? Why did he just, you know, he knew Daniel would, would give him the, provide him the answer, and Daniel was the, the person who was managing his entire court. And he was, he was organising who's coming in and who's, his, uh, his stately visits or whatever, whatever else may have been involved in that particular job. He didn't call Daniel, he called all these people that he knew had failed before. But I wonder whether he did that just to see whether they could interpret his particular dream. And maybe because he knew Daniel would give him the right answer, he thought, maybe he thought to himself, oh, let me give him one more go. And then I'll check it against what Daniel has to say. But at the end, they said to him, uh, sorry, kid, you can't do it. Probably a pretty wise move when you think about it. They played it safe. And the dream, it says here, it was troubling him. It was, it was, it was concerning to him. And he probably gathered it had something to do with him. And probably on a personal level, something was going to affect him personally, and he was getting worried about what was going on. I mean, he had these, these beings, these watches who came to him. But let's look at his description. Look at verse 13. He says, I saw in the visions of my head, upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. <clears throat> he cried aloud and said, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and, and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen now, though, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. What's interesting is um, the, the message that these, these uh, watchers give him is that, you know what, King? God can set up kingdoms. God is the one who authorizes the kingdoms, and he can put over them the most foolish and basest of persons. So don't think yourself to be greater than everyone else on the earth simply because you rule the actual place. Because God can put the lowliest person in that position. But the thing that most people question or wonder is who are these beings called watchers? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a strange thing when you when you see this, this phrase of watchers and holy ones, and who are they? Uh, how can these beings actually communicate via dreams or visit someone in their in their dreams and give the decrees of God? How can they, they be involved in the business of God and the business and the affairs of men? And and uh, who were they watching? Well, you already know. There is another type of entity that God has created called angels. 
of various sorts and given different names. We talk, we call them angels as a general term, but there are specific angels and they exist in the heavenly realm. And that realm is invisible to our eyes and they are invisible to us, but we are not invisible to them. They can see us while we can't see them. And they can be literally sitting next to you right now in those vacant seats because there are plenty of them in the shed today. There's a few extra angels fill up seats there. <laughs> the scriptures teach that when God laid the foundation of the world, of the earth, when God created the earth, you know who was there to watch it? The angels. Turn with me to Job chapter 38. They can see us, they can see our universe, they can see the world, but we cannot see them. Job 38, verse 4. It says there, Job 38, 4. Where was thou? Now, Joe, God is speaking to Joe. Where was thou? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? And whereupon are the foundations there, thereof fastened? Where are, they, where are they hanging on to? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When God laid the very foundations of the world, the angels were there watching what was going on. And they shouted for joy when they saw the amazing creation that God had made. The angels in heaven not only witnessed the creation of the earth, the laying of its foundations, they could see it from their heavenly perspective, but they continue to, to see it today. We are continually visible. In front of them and they are still invisible to us turn to Matthew chapter 18 because the Lord gives another interesting little bit of information regarding these these beings for those of you who have ever wondered whether you have a guardian angel and some of you may be thinking of guardian angels for a fair bit of work <laughs> 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 <clears throat> wonder if angels take stress leave. I don't know. <laughs> Matthew 18, verse 10. <laughs> yeah, so, so, the ones that are laughing the loudest, you know. You're the ones causing the stress leave. Matthew 18, 10. When, when they, they didn't want the children to come to Jesus, when they, when, they, when they thought, no, no, that's below what our master should be doing, 18 verse 10 says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So if you're wondering whether you have an angel, well, the odds are you've actually got some or even more that are actually watching out for you. Yeah. And they are beholding our Father's face, and He maybe sends them on errands when we mess up, or when we need direction, or we need protection because the other ones wants to get involved in our lives. One of the benefits of being an angel is, it seems, the ability to be able to see the world we live in while we can't see them. Calling them watchers is really an apt description. Then. Because if you could be anywhere and you could see anything and they couldn't see you, what would you be watching? Would you sneak into a game of Carlton versus Collingwood? No, you wouldn't do that, would you? Would you listen to maybe the, the, the ramblings of, the, of our leaders as they work out what to do in the next lockdown? <laughs> I don't know. But these beings, they calling them watchers is probably an apt description because they watch and they can watch wherever, whenever they want and no one knows when they're watching. So calling them watchers and calling them holy because they serve God and they are in his presence all the time is a very apt description 
for them. And God has used them to communicate his will to mankind from the very beginning and also to do work for him from the very beginning. One example of these messengers, which is specifically named in the Bible, and the first time his name comes up is in this book, is Gabriel. We know that they have names. And Gabriel is a messenger from God who delivered messages not just to Daniel, but also to Joseph and Mary. You may also not be aware that God used angels to deliver the law. So when Moses was receiving the law, and we know that he wrote down those first five books of the Bible, um, I don't just assume, assume that there was a funnel coming from heaven that, you know, that sort of emptied into his head and he just, he just wrote, maybe. But the Bible says that the angels were involved in more ways than we actually probably imagine. I'll give you a couple of examples of that now. Turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 53. Acts chapter 7, verse 53. And there are more examples that mention how angels were involved in the delivering of the law. Um, then you probably have noticed, or even I noticed, I, I didn't notice this as much before. I knew they were mentioned. I didn't take much thought about it, though. So Stephen, before he was martyred, gave a, an incredible speech to the people who were uh, who were putting him on trial, had him on trial, um, and he argued, and he, and he made mention that Israel had not kept the law, which was delivered by angels. Look at Acts seven fifty three. He says, "Who have received?" This is talking to them, to his uh, to his people. He says, "Who have received the law." by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So he says that the law was delivered by angels. How? We don't exactly know. But Paul argues the same thing. Paul argued that the purpose of the law was to expose or magnify the transgressions of men. In other words, to show man how sinful he actually was. So God added a few more laws and, and, made, it, and, and made it in a way to show us how bad we actually were. He says that these laws were ordained by angels and there was a mediator. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.19 says... Wherefore then serve the law? What's the purpose of the law? What good is it? He says it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. He's speaking about Christ. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Who was the mediator? Well, God gave Moses to be the mediator of that, of that thing. He held that thing in his hand, delivered it to the people. Who delivered it to him? The Bible says the angels actually delivered it to him. <clears throat> but what about the gospel now? So, so if the law was if the law was delivered by angels, what about what about now? Well, the gospel that we have, and this is the the culmination I want to show you, Hebrews chapter two. Since the arrival of our Savior into this world, the Bible says that. The angels delivered the law in the beginning, but he delivered the final message personally himself. So while the angels delivered the law, the Bible says that the deliverer of the gospel was God himself in his son, Jesus Christ. And so where Moses was the previous mediator, the Bible now says that, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So we have one mediator, one deliverer of the message. So, and look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Because this is the challenge that we have to share this message with other people. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. That's speaking about the gospel now. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. In other words, God judged you for not keeping the law and obeying it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So you see the argument? If God didn't let people go, if God judged harshly people who disobeyed the law that he delivered by angels, the apostle says, how much more should we take heed of the gospel message that gives us salvation when God delivered it through his own son? Which one is he going to judge more harshly? The rejection of an angel or the rejection of his own son? simple point is that God has used angels to deliver messages in the past, to deliver his decrees, to proclaim and enforce his laws. And as in this, this example of Nebuchadnezzar and in the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, you'll see angels involved. And there are a great many number of them by the looks of it. The decrees they deliver are the decrees of God himself, and it seems as if they sit in some sort of a council together. They have hierarchies within themselves, and they sit in councils, and they've got jobs to do, and they have meetings, and they judge, and they carry out God's, God's decrees. On the flip side of that, we have an opposing council of angels. So while God has his council of angels and they deliver his decrees and laws, there is an opposing council of angels who also exist in the heavenly realm. Not in heaven itself, right near, near God's throne, but within heaven's domain. Okay? They also watch. They're also cloaked in invisibility, cloaked from our view, and they seek to implement an alternative plan. Alternate degree, uh, uh, decrees throughout mankind's history. If you look at history, ambitious men have existed throughout all the time who have sought to conquer and control other people. But they, through most of that time, have failed to recognize that they have been the ones being, who are being controlled by someone else. And this angelic uh, court. Um, just as God has his angelic court and, 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 and sends de decrees, so too the devil has his own demonic court that he uses to advance his own agenda, a conflicting agenda to God's, to undermine God's rules, to undermine God's decrees. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. And this is the challenge that we have as believers in this world. Ephesians 6 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our fight isn't with other people. That's actually what I'm saying. Our fight is not against other people. As demented or evil or whatever, it's not against them. That's not our fight. But against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Where do they exist? In high places. They exist in heaven's realm. In, in the same place the other angels, God's angels exist, except they are in contradiction to them. And they are enthroned in people's hearts, and they seek to rule in darkness. That's why the Bible says that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He is called the prince, according to the Bible. He's also called the god of this world. Ephesians 2, 2 says, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If the devil is a prince, then he also has princes that serve him. On God's side, there are two princes that are specifically mentioned in Daniel. One is Michael and Gabriel. But there are also other princes that are mentioned in Daniel as well, which are not God's princes, which are the devil's princes. And the first mention of the prince of Persia, the prince of Persia is not a man. The prince of Persia is not a, a prince. And then he mentions the, pre, the prince of Grecia. That's not Alexander the Great or anyone uh, related to Alexander the Great. Uh, in chapter 10, as you turn back to chapter 10 with me for the moment, Gabriel tells, so, sorry, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Did I say that? Daniel 10, 13. In this chapter, Gabriel tells Daniel that he managed, he only managed to get through to Daniel with a message from God, so he was the messenger. He only managed to get through after 21 days because Michael helped him to get through. Now, what's going on with that? How can an angel not get through from God to Daniel, someone like Daniel, for 21 days? Well, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, tells us who withstood him for 21 days. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, just, just let that sink in just for a moment. That God sent his angel Gabriel to deliver a message, which is prophetic to Daniel, and Gabriel couldn't get through for 21 days. That's not a person that's stopping him from getting through. That's the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia, which, which is a demonic being that ruled over Persia. Think about that for a moment. And then he says that when, I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to listen here in a, in, in a minute. After him, another one is going to come. And we don't even know. We're not sure about, he says that when he arrived, it, Gabriel says, I remain there with the kings of Persia. Now, is he talking about earthly kings? Or is he talking about other kings? We're not entirely sure. Whether they were another class of angel, we, we don't know. But it seems that Michael is in this particular class of angel. He is a prince, okay, that, that, that has governance over a particular group of people. And in fact, he's called the chief prince. And so, and he was the only one who helped Gabriel get through this particular thing. Look at verse 20 in chapter 10. So once again, Gabriel speaking, and he says, Then said he, Knowest thou, wherefore I came, I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. So he says that Michael is Daniel's prince. It seems that Michael has the specific assignment to watch over God's people, the Jews. He's also mentioned again in Daniel 12. So turn to Turn to Daniel chapter 12 again with me, just verse 1. Where once again, he's prophesied about coming at a time when God's people, when, when Israel once again is, is factoring in this whole thing, right at the end of time. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, and at that time, this is called the end of the, this is the, the tribulation period, right? Called Jacob's trouble. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. 
And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Just go on in. Well, if you want to take your time, look at Revelation chapter 12. It describes that war that goes on. It describes how actually Michael leads and hit the armies of heaven against the devil and his armies, and they kick them out of heaven. In other words, they can't go back to their hiding place anymore. They kick, you know where? Into the earth. And they know their time is short. And that's when things go really downhill in those last few uh, years. So the existence of angels, both holy and fallen, is taught consistently throughout the Bible. From the very first chapters of Genesis until the end of the book of Revelation, there have been watchers over mankind. There have been messengers. There have been those who have influenced mankind. And if they're holy, they're doing God's business. If they're unholy, they're doing the devil's business. And those two are in contradiction to each other. So Nebuchadnezzar had been visited by beings who were telling him they'd come from God. And they're about to tell him this is what's going to happen because God has decreed what's, got, what's, what's happened. Because his pride and his arrogance had risen too high. And he was about, he was about to be taught a lesson from God himself that would humble him before God. And now Daniel provides the interpretation of the train. So Daniel chapter 4, let's look at verse 20 to 24. Daniel chapter 4, verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one come down from heaven and saying, hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord, the King. The great tree was the King, who had become so strong that his empire and his greatness had reached to the ends of the earth. And because he was the ultimate authority, he covered the, not only covered the earth, but he provided the kingdom that provided the food, the sustenance of people that were under his domain. His leaves and his fruit was for all the people. In other words, they relied on him. But because of his arrogance and pride, the scriptures say here that he would be cut down and, and sealed and stopped for seven years from growing. And that he would lose his great power. But he would not be destroyed. It says we're not going to destroy you completely. If you want to destroy a tree, how do you do that? You, you don't just chop the tree down, right? <laughs> you got to destroy the whole roots, right? Yeah. So they knew that in those days. And so he said, no, no, we're going to put a band of thing around you. We're going to stop you from growing, but we're not going to destroy the root system. Because after seven years, we're going to turn it loose again, and it's going to begin to grow again. And that was when he had learned his lesson. So what was the lesson that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to, to learn? Well, Angels, all these mad thoughts that would drive him away from men in a way that would see him behave and act like a beast of the field. So he says, oh, he's going to have a, the, the, the heart, he was given the heart of a beast. And he wouldn't have any regard for the luxury that he'd come to enjoy, for the greatness that he'd come to, to have. 
and that he was accustomed to, but he'd been preserved alive until he came to the understanding that he was not God, that he was not greater than God, that there was one God who had given him this, this, uh, this power and to whom he must bow down. And he was commanded to stop sinning. And God wanted him to do that which was right, to be considerate towards the poor who depended upon him. And if he humbled himself and did right, the promise was that his peaceful rule would be extended. So look, let's look at verse 25. That they drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So God had seen the pride of Nebuchadnezzar in his heart, that he thought himself more important and high and greater than what he actually was, and the purpose of the, the decree was to humble him. To realise that his rule was given to him, and to provide a, a written testimony that we're reading two and a half thousand years later that declare how wonderful God is and that God is the only ruler. God actually gave him another 12 months, he says. He gave him another 12 months of grace and it seems as if Nebuchadnezzar had actually changed during that time. It seems as if he had begun to do the right thing. Maybe he got the message, but then he forgot it. Because in verse 28, it says, All of this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Doesn't sound too humble, really. <coughs> Pride was still a problem, and God's punishment was immediate and complete. Look at the result. Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, as Hakeem was still saying it, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from among from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. And the command was given. And Nebuchadnezzar spent the next seven years of his life behaving like an animal outdoors. God had given him some sort of a mental illness that caused him not only to, to run away from men, but to abandon his luxury, his reason, his power, and to dwell like an animal in the fields. What he had was probably a mental disorder called lycanthropy. There's actually a name for it, okay? Because it happens occasionally to people where they actually believe that, or they become delusional about thinking about they've been turned into an animal. And they behave like the animal. So it's actually a, 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 a psychiatric condition. And yes, people suffer from a similar thing today. But maybe they're not warned as Nebuchadnezzar was warned about it before. What's interesting about this period of judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar, who lived like a beast, mirrors seven years. 
in the future. You see, the last seven years before the return of Christ to this earth, there, those seven years will see the introduction of someone called the beast in this world. And this world that we've seen are going to lose their minds. They're going to do things that they had never done before, and they will behave pretty savagely toward one another, and especially against those who have put their faith in Christ. And that's when God judges the actual earth. So God's judgment upon the earth during those last seven years almost mirrors the seven years where Nebuchadnezzar acts like a beast in this world. <clears throat> but for Nebuchadnezzar, something had changed after seven years. Look at verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honour him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? After seven years, Nebuchadnezzar suddenly returned to him, and unlike an animal, like a, a, a bull or a, uh, or a pig, that don't look upwards, but spend all their days foraging on the ground or eating, eating and looking down upon the earth, he looked up to heaven. And he blessed God. And while, while he was in that particular state, his son, uh, I think his name is called Evel, or evil Merodach ruled as regent in his place while they hoped for his return. I think they knew because Daniel would have told them that this was going to last for a period of seven years. So they didn't get rid of him completely. They just waited for him. They let him finish eating his, his graves and whatever he was doing, eating hay or whatever he was eating during those seven years. And they knew he was actually eventually going to come back. And during that time, it says, we, his, his nails kept on growing and growing, became like claws, essentially. And his hair got more and more matted and grew longer and longer, and it looked like eagle feathers. After he returned, he ruled for another year from that particular state. And God had granted him mercy in order that this decree, this testimony that we're reading today would be circulated in all the earth and listed in the Bible. How's that, mate? His, his decree got listed in God's eternal word. That's not bad, huh? For someone who was an animal for seven years. <clears throat> Consider carefully, though, his testimony. He blessed God. He praised God. He honoured God who he declared was eternal in nature, who was the ultimate ruler, whose rule never fades, though man come and go. He said he was so great that the inhabitants of the earth were like nothing before him. He always does as he pleases. He admitted God was unstoppable and that he can't be questioned. Now, if you were to write a thesis, For theology about God, spot on. Spot on. It says that he is omnipotent, omniscient. It says that he is, it says that he is so much bigger than anything else in this universe. It, it, he covers everything. And then he also says that he honors, he praises him. And he showed him the, the respect and admiration that he deserved. That's a, that's a good final year thesis for a theology student, and you'd probably get an A-plus for it. You know, but then he goes on to add, after he had been restored to his, his magisterial sort of position, that he now believed in God. Look what it says in verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honour and brightness returned unto me. And my counsellors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, 
and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And if you're looking forward to being in heaven one day, and you're wondering, as you walk those streets, who else you might have walking next to you? Pay a thought for King Nebuchadnezzar. You may actually see a previous king of Babylon walking alongside you. Just an interesting thought, isn't it? Based upon his testimony here, you know when we, when we accept people in membership, we, we, we get a testimony from them. We want to know what they believe and you know, what relationship they have with God. If someone came to with this testimony and says, I honor the God of heaven, I praise him, I, I, I love him, whatever. If someone gave me that, that's a pretty good testimony. I'd, I'd struggle to actually, apart from the gospel message, which, uh, which I didn't have in those days, uh, that's a pretty good testimony. So if you're looking forward to catching up with, you know, some Old Testament favourites of yours, you may actually find a few other ones in there, like King Nebuchadnezzar, who may be walking the streets with us. Let me close this story. James tells us in verse, chapter 4, verse 6, that God giveth grace to the humble. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We are feeble. Man is feeble, weak, short-minded, <clears throat> very limited. Okay? We are fragile beings. The Bible says we are like a vapor. That's here today and gone tomorrow. We are like a dust and like a, a thing that burns up and is finished. <clears throat> There is no reason for us to be proud. There is no reason for us to be arrogant. Not even toward each other. Because if we begin to compare ourselves to each other, then we are foolish. Because we should only be comparing ourselves to one. Pride is particularly infectious and can reveal itself in a number of different ways. Oftentimes it seeps in and you don't know you're, you've got it. Okay? Um, it's a bit like having being asymptomatic with COVID. Right? Um, you may find yourself gossiping about other people. That's a symptom of pride. You may be, find yourself being unthankful. <coughs> symptom of pride. Uncaring. Worldly. You may find yourself being arrogant. Easily offended. As symptoms of pride. Don't let pride keep you from humbling yourselves before God. Always stay humble because God gives more and more grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. Unfortunately, there will be many whose pride will keep them out of heaven. But our job is to show them what genuine humbleness is. If we can be humble toward them, Maybe they'll learn a lesson like King Nebuchadnezzar. God bless you. Thank you for the uh, lovely message, Pastor Frank. In response to the message, can we all rise for the closing here? Here number one, or worship the king. <laughs> Thank you.